how do you start your agency? Like, because I think yeah. like the really powerful thing behind your story is like you went from homeless, you went from overdosing, you went from being in jail as a teenager to now like you're a multimillionaire agency owner. And uh, I was making between like 30 and 40 grand a month. Like a lot of our clients, we have clients that we've retained for two years. Any Anybody is one bad decision away from losing everything. And that was like probably that was definitely the hardest moment of my life because it's like, look, now I'm screwed. All right. This is the official start of the podcast sound. That sounds really intense. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> it sounds way too intense. Guys, we are here with the legend and such a close friend of mine, Cameron Springer. Cameron, how you doing, man? Doing great. Doing great. Glad to be here. Yeah. So for those of you guys that don't know Cameron, he's a seven-figure agency owner. Tell us a little bit about your agency. Why don't yeah. we start there? So we're growth marketing media, and what we do is uh, help businesses become known online uh, through organic methods, SEO, web development. So that's what we do. So it's mainly SEO, right? Yeah. Cool. So I think uh, really why I wanted to bring Cameron on here, not only just to share his story of scaling his agency to seven figures, which is really amazing. We're going to ask you a lot about the agency, how you did it, especially in SEO, which is super competitive. It's been around for a long, long time, so it's hard to get clients. And yeah. I know that you scaled up with like cold calling mainly, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Cold calling and referrals. Yeah. Going to events, meeting people. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm definitely going to pick your brain on that. But um, really the reason why I brought Cameron on today is because his story is one of the most inspiring stories of anyone that I've ever met in my entire life. When he first told me his story, we were actually snowboarding, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, we were in Breckenridge. Yeah. And uh, we're going up the lift. And then you tell me these stories. And I was like, dude, I don't want to get off the lift. I want to keep hearing the story. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know why I'm telling you this. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we had just met, right? Yeah. And, um, and uh, what's what's wild is, uh, you know, when you get off the lift, it's not like you keep talking to the person. You kind of ride on the way down. And you kept leaving me on these cliffhangers. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. uh, we had to go all the way down and wait to go on the lift again to keep hearing these stories. And it was such like life changing. And you guys will, will, will listen, such life changing stories that I was like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm watching a Netflix show live. So with that in mind, Cameron, like I'd love, and then, ooh, one last thing. Um, and then I know you, you ended up joining our program, Agency Lab. What, what revenue were you at kind of when you joined? When I joined the previous, that previous year, I had done 400,000. What is that divided by 12? <laughs> uh, like it was, it was in, I mean, I was at, like, at the end of that year, I was at 60,000. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. And then now you're obviously doing over 100K a month. So yeah. you, you've seen some massive growth. And I'd love to hear that as well. But bef before we uh, dive in to the agency stuff, like, why don't we tell people your story? Yeah. So, man, yeah, where to start? So, yeah, I grew up in uh, in a in a pretty good home. Um, there was definitely like we weren't we weren't rich by any means. Like we we definitely didn't have a lot of money. My dad and I didn't have the best relationship growing up. Um, my mom and I had a great relationship growing up, and that's something that's changed actually uh, in the past few years. Like my dad and I now have a great relationship, which is awesome. But yeah, it wasn't it wasn't good. Went through like a lot of uh, a lot of like abusive situations, and so that fast forwarding into my like young. <clears throat> young teenage years, like 13, 14, I ended up getting getting in trouble with the law. I was just like an angry kid. I ended up like slashing the whole neighborhood's tires. Wow. And, yeah. And I I had to pay them all back. When I was when I was 14, I paid back like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in restitution. Wow. And uh I did that by going door to door selling newspaper subscriptions. But I was just like an angry kid because I had like I had a really bad relationship with my father. So um, and I don't blame him for any of that anymore. Like I used to. And I think that's why I kept going down the wrong path. But like that was just the beginning of it. Moving past that, like that's when I really started experimenting with drugs and alcohol. And uh, the first time I actually overdosed was when I was uh, 15 years old. And I they found me in a in like a drainage ditch because I was walking to the liquor store to go get more alcohol. And I had taken just some fentanyl candies and my friend at the time, like I was just hanging out with the wrong people and they were like, Hey, you got to, uh, you got to chug these forties. Like, otherwise you're not hard. So. Wow. Yeah. You were 15. Uh huh. That's insane. It's wild by the way. Cause looking at you now, like you're such a kind, genuine person and like so successful and it's like, it's just wild to hear your story, you know, but so, so you were 15 and you overdosed. Yeah. Yeah. So I woke up in the hospital and I had like tubes in my throat. Like my dad showed me pictures and I wasn't supposed to make it through the night. 
yeah, I had tubes everywhere, like catheter tubes, like tubes down my throat. Um, and I was on probation at the time for all those like incidents with the tire stuff. And uh, so I just remember wondering like what my probation officer was going to think. I didn't really think much about that I almost died. I don't think I ever did because I, following that, I overdosed nine more times in the hospital. Wow. Um, and every time it happened, I guess we can kind of get into that later. But yeah, I just, uh, you think you would learn from that, but like, but I didn't. And I kept going harder. Like every time, every time something would happen that was like really, really bad, everyone kept telling me like, you have all these red flags in your life. And I just thought it was normal. Like I thought that it was normal to have things like that happen all the time because the people I was surrounded with also had those things happen. So, so then you, um, you overdosed nine more times. Yeah. How? Like, how did. Like, it's just, and again, I, 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 yeah, keep going, keep going. Like, tell us more, tell us, as, and obviously as much as you feel comfortable with, but like, um, so you, t- tell us more about that. So through 15, I mean, I spent a lot of time in uh, different like juvenile type correction facilities, like five months in this place called the Children's Ark, uh, several months in a place called Spring Creek. It was like a juvenile detention center. Uh, then I went back there and then I spent like a few days there, um, just like in and out of all these different places. And then the state co- took custody of me when I was, uh, they, they first took custody of me when I was, I was actually 14 when they first took custody of me. And then I spent my 15th birthday in that place called the Children's Ark. And then I got out of there in about six months. And just, I, I kind of was doing, I, I kind of felt like I maybe learned something, um, but I didn't really deal with the core issues that were inside of me, like why I was doing what I was doing. And so I quickly started hanging out with the wrong people again, and then uh, ended up getting in a bad situation where I was drinking on the job. At, I was going door to door selling newspaper subscriptions. And my dad and I had just like had a huge fight. And I was, so I was drinking on the job and I was still selling newspaper subscriptions, but like the boss found out and he's like, look, like you're fired. I'd actually been fired multiple times from that job previously, but then they, they wanted me to come back and I'm like, all right, look, I'm not going to do it again. I'm just going to sell a ton of newspaper subscriptions. (laughs) And, uh, so they dropped me off at like this Sonic. I punched the Sonic sign and like punched a hole in it. And then I got jumped by the Sonic employees, uh, cause it was like, there was a gang there, like at the Sonic. It was a weird situation. It was back where I grew up. Um, and anyways, long story short, I ended up going to the hospital there because I was bleeding quite a bit and um, woke up in the hospital. Uh, I, I remembered the ambulance ride, but so then that's when I got taken. They took custody of me the next time, Department of Human Services. They sent me to several different group homes. Um, I went to one in Canyon City. The one in Canyon City, there was... It was just all kids. It was like being run by kids. The, the like the adults weren't there. We were like, like they were like, it's your turn to cook dinner. I'm like, I never cooked dinner for this many people. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely interesting. And then my parents came to visit me there and they didn't have like things weren't up to code. And so they, they took me out of that one. They sent me to a different one called the Prospect House. I got into like a fight with someone there. So then they sent me to a different place called uh, Southern Peaks. It was like a regional treatment center. They sent like the worst of the worst kids there. Um, like I was in there with a lot of my friends there are, are from back in that time are either dead or like one of them got caught making a meth lab in the dryer there. Oh um, just like the worst of the worst kids possible. So I, uh, I just learned a lot of bad things in those places, I think. So there's definitely some issues with like the system in that. And I think that's a whole nother topic Um, because you're putting in a bunch of kids that are like all are troubled and now they're all like networking together. (laughs) So Mm. it was, uh, yeah, it was just, I kept getting in these bad situations, hanging out with the wrong people. So eventually I guess I'll just move in. That was when I was 16. So moving into when I was like eight, six, 17, 18, I started getting way more involved in like pain medication, pain pills, Percocets, oxys, um, and was spending five hundred dollars per day on pain pills. Wow! And just like popping them, snorting them, smoking them, like doing everything I possibly could with them, injecting them, and uh, it just got too expensive. Like five hundred dollars a day. There's days I spent more than five hundred dollars, and all this time I was running like an eBay business, selling phones on the internet, and. Uh, so moving past that, I actually got in trouble with the law on that. Um, I ended up getting an indictment, uh, 
I was indicted by the grand jury because I was like selling all kinds of phones and I didn't realize like I was just I was selling so many phones. I didn't I didn't really know what was going on, but I ended up getting uh, selling the wrong phones and they ended up being stolen. So I yeah, I went through an indictment and that was like probably that was definitely the hardest moment of my life. That was way harder than drug addiction because mm. it's like, look, now I'm screwed. Like, I didn't even really, I didn't understand that all these phones were stolen. Like, I'm just selling all kinds of phones. I was selling, like, I don't know exactly how many phones. I mean, I was selling hundreds of phones. I was just buying them from people on Craigslist. Somebody got a new phone. I bought it from them, sold it on eBay. And so I just remember, and this was when I was 23. I kind of jumped through. There's a lot that happened in between that time. There was a lot of, that, that was actually when a lot of drug overdoses happened in between 18 and, and 23. Um, but I guess moving into that situation, that was definitely the hardest part of my life because I went to jail and then I bonded out. I was on a $50,000 bond and my, uh, and then, so I was like, so depressed. I'm like, I started drinking and just doing heroin and like all kinds of drugs. Like, I just like, I literally wanted to die at that point. Cause I'm like, this is like, I just didn't want to face it. Like, even if I didn't like do what they were saying, it was like, they were telling me like this, this is some like significant prison time. And I'm like, my life is over. So I, yeah, I just, I started going hard again on, on drugs. And eventually I went to the hospital again for like, I don't think I overdosed, but I was pretty close. I went to the hospital and then they sent me to jail cause I violated bond. And I just remember like being in that, in that jail cell, like thinking, man, like, I wonder like even if I could get like six, six to eight years. And at that point I got a letter in the mail when I was in jail that I lost my license for like five years. So it was just because I was, I was driving and like I'd, I had some previous DUIs and it was uh, just all of this to say, like, it's hard for me to honestly believe where, where I was and where I am now. Because, you know, when I first met you, you come off as really kind, very successful, like, and you are. It, it, when you started telling me these stories, I almost didn't believe you, you know? I, 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 no, I like pushed back a little bit. I, you remember you told me about the jail story? Yeah. They gave you the nickname. What was the nickname again? Uh, Kill a KO? Kill a KO. Oh, yeah. And now I was like, this guy, is he lying to me? And I, I was like pushing. It doesn't seem real. Yeah, it doesn't seem real. And, and I think like, and I know you're going to keep going with your story, but like one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on here more than anything else is because I truly believe from the bottom of my heart, your story will inspire thousands, if not millions of people. and even if this video only reaches Thank a few you. thousand, like that is so much impact in this world. And it is, um, I'm just grateful that I have somewhat of a vehicle, somewhat of a channel to be able to share your story. I, yeah. And I really appreciate you for having me on here to do that and your heart behind that. And, and I also appreciate everything you've done for me and my agency and your team. So, um, yeah, but it, it just talking about this, it's, it's, uh, it's hard for me to believe that, um, that I was there because it's, and I think that's something I've been thinking about recently is uh, that it's so easy to, even with everything I've been through, like I've like, my friends have gotten shot, like I've overdosed so many times, like even with everything that I've been through, like I still can sometimes, I don't want to say forget, but like in moments I feel like maybe forget and just kind of uh, be stuck in the current situation that I'm in. Like let's say uh, in business. I'm having a uh, like a tough day with uh, with a client or like with a team member. And it's like, man, like this is. But then but then when I really sit and reflect, it's like if I made it through all of that, it's like I literally can make it through anything. Wow. And that's what I've really been on recently is it's like, man, like I and every single one of us like you. I mean, we all have a story. and We all have been through things. So. When you're having that tough day, when there's an issue that you're going through and you just feel like there's no way out of this or like you're not really thinking on the bigger picture, it just helps me so much recently to think back to those times um, and remember, wow, like if I can get through that. I can get through anything. I think, um, I don't, you know, I don't want to impose my own beliefs on, you know, our relationship, our friendship, but I truly believe that you should share your story as much as humanly possible. You know, I think, uh. Because it's not talk, you know, it's like I can sit here and be like, hey, when you're having a tough moment, focus on the bigger picture. And yeah, I've had difficulties, but let's be honest, nowhere near as, as 
complicated and, and dangerous and difficult as yours. And I think that when you say it, it carries so much more weight and people have almost no option but to believe it, believe that there's something brighter, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So, okay, yeah. let, let's go back to the story for a little bit. So you were 23. You were selling the phones on eBay. They were actually elite, uh, stolen phones. Not all of them, but just a group of them. Okay, so a group of them, and then you got put in jail. Uh-huh. Um, then it seems like you got out of jail, mm-hmm. but then you went back to jail. Yeah. And then how did you end up homeless? Oh, yeah. So that was actually before that. <laughs> it was like, it was, I'm telling you, it was like from 15 until like 23, it was miserable. Like every single day was miserable. Like I literally hated my life so much. And so I I kind of forgot about that when I'm sharing everything. But yeah, I was I was homeless in in Denver, just downtown right here. I slept under Colfax and I-25. I slept under the bridge. We went and like had to get a tent to sleep under the bridge. And <clears throat> I got in that situation because I was at my my I was at my parents' house because they were kind of like letting me stay there. And I was just using drugs all the time. Like, and I was, my, my main connect was down here in Denver. So my parents kicked me out finally. They're like, we've had enough of this. And uh, so I just moved to Denver. And by moved, I mean, I just took a bus down here and got off and uh, had nowhere to stay, nowhere to go. So The first few nights I slept at the, like the Denver rescue mission. It's like the homeless shelter. And then I ended up meeting people there. So I ended up sleeping on someone's couch, uh, for a while. And then I got involved with someone that I had known previously. And that's the person that, uh, I ended up like sleeping under that bridge with. And I remember, I still remember we had to pump up an air mattress and there was like a Bronco game going on. I think they were playing the Patriots and everyone was going towards the Bronco game. And I just remember I was carrying an air mattress walking in the opposite direction because mm. I was walking back to where under the bridge was. And I was just like, this is embarrassing. But like no one saw my face because I, I didn't want to show my face. But and I I mean, there was times where I literally like in that in those moments, I had to do whatever it took to. Unfortunately, I had to do whatever it took to get drugs. So like whatever that meant, I had to do it. And so I would literally like go out and like hold signs. And like literally beg people for money and like, and I've never shared any of this publicly, but I would do that. And like, I would go to areas that I thought that no one would know me because I, uh, I didn't want, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want someone to recognize me and be like, what are you doing? Uh, cause I, I don't know what I was doing. It was, I, I have no idea what I was doing. I don't know why I was doing that, but I just did whatever it took. And I think, I think that's why I'm so successful when it comes to cold calling, cold outreach just because, like, it's kind of the same mentality. Like, at a certain at a certain point, like, especially cold outreach, you got to just go hard and, like, hammer it. And you can't give up. So, by the way, I, I just want to say it takes so much courage for you to share your story. And just know that it's going to inspire so many people, man. And uh, I know that there's a lot of teenagers watching this, a lot of 20-year-olds watching this. People that maybe feel that same sense of, like, lost hope or um, that sen- same sense of, like, you know, life isn't worth living or maybe just some dark thoughts. And I know that this is going to just you being here is proof. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, you know? Um, so just again, thank you. And I'm going to keep thanking you because it's, I'm just grateful. Um, of course. Okay. So then you then got out of jail or Mm -hmm. how how did you, uh, so yeah, I did go to jail after that too. You've been homeless. You overdosed nine I, more uh, 10 times 10 times in the hospital you've been to jail which by the end maybe at the end i want you to share some jail stories because <laughs> really <laughs> yeah, but just take, bring back the uh, glass it sounds like a uh kind of like a jail cell really yeah do it yeah imagine that oh that's why you said at the beginning yeah, yeah. memories, <laughs> and i was like what are you talking about yeah man i feel bad now that i no 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 it's just because we were here doing <laughs> this and that it's just like <laughs> yeah, like that kind of sounds like a metal. It cord. sounds like me. I'm trying to torture you or some shit. <laughs> like just, on the record, I'm really good friends with Cameron. <laughs> Tell them I'm good friends. I'm yeah, we're good too, friends. I'm not <laughs> trying to torture. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so so okay, so you um you you've been through some dark times, man, and you've been through some difficult times. How did you get out of that? Like, what is yeah. that process like? Yeah, it's a hard process. Um, cause I tried to get out of it a lot. I tried to get out of it many times. Would you say that's the hardest thing you've ever done? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To get out, 
of a place because you're kind of in a pattern. Like not only is it an addiction because like you're addicted to the drugs, but you're also in a pattern. You're around the wrong people. You're constantly surrounded in the wrong environment. Um, so it's just, it's almost like everything is working against you. Mm. So if you don't start changing some of those pieces, like your environment, for instance, um, my environment was one of the biggest factors on, on that, I believe. So what I had to do is I actually, I started hanging out literally like in church. Like I met a lot of very, very positive people that, uh, that loved God and like, and, and I just started learning more about God and like what he just that he loved me and and like and honestly that uh and and these are things that I think that maybe I knew in my like head but I didn't know in my heart because there's a difference between head and heart knowledge so I just had to I started changing my environment right so I started hanging out with different people like um I met my wife for instance she was my wife at the time but she has an awesome family um awesome community like none of these people do drugs like none of them they don't have like all these issues, like not saying that like everyone, not saying they're perfect or anyone's perfect, but like they didn't have all like, cause a lot of my family has just different baggage and like, and like issues just even in the extended family. And, um, so I have to, I had to change my environment. Like first and foremost, I had to change my environment. But how did you decide? How did you, how did that shift? Are you like, there's a one thing, was it like, or was it just a little by little things started to shift? Oh yeah. I remember I was, uh, so I had quit again for a while and I was living actually in downtown Denver at, at, uh, these apartments. I had an awesome view of downtown, like the skyline. And I was doing really good, uh, cold calling people and selling them golf course advertising. So you got a job. It yeah. Sounds like. Yeah. So I got a good job. Um, yeah. Cause it's kind of like, you can't, you, you don't just walk into the apartment one day. Yeah. 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 No, no. I, I, yeah. so that's how I got to, how I got to that. So I, I so actually, you, so you went to church, you started meeting good people. You I went to a, a sober living house. Okay. So the first thing I did, got out of jail. I went to a sober living house. Um, in that sober living house, it just, it gave me a little bit of time to get under my feet, get a job, like do what I need to do to get kind of, and at first when I went to the sober living house, I actually woke up at 4am so that I could walk for like an hour to the day labor place just so that I could get money to pay for the sober living house while I was looking for another job and figuring things out. Cause like, I didn't know what to do. I, I had zero dollars. I had absolutely nothing. Like I had no one to rely on. So I was working like a uh, weird jobs for day labor type stuff. Um, which sucked really bad, <laughs> but I, I, I had to do whatever I had to do. And like at that moment in time, like that was the, the best way that I knew that, uh, I could do that while looking for something else. So got out of the sober living house, um, went to another sober living house actually for like three months. And then that's when we got an apartment, uh, my friend and I, and, but then I, I kind of relapsed back there cause I, I, I wasn't really serious about it. I don't think. So I started drinking, uh, drinking alcohol. And for me, like I can't do anything, right? Like I can't drink alcohol because it leads, it leads me to other things. Like I just, so you got to cut it off. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. For me, like I, I need to be 100% there, like sober minded that that's for me. Like other people might be cool with like drinking and stuff and they can make it work. But for me, like I have to be a hundred percent sober otherwise. So then you relapsed again. And then what happened? Like, how did you officially break out? Yeah. So I relapsed again and basically <clears throat> I, yeah, I was just sitting on the couch and like, and I started like, and this was when I was 24. So I, and I'm 28 now. So I just had, I have just over four and a half years coming up on four and a half years, uh, completely sober, clean, like from everything. And, but in that moment, I'm um, just like my, actually like my body started to like, it, it was not taking it the same way it was like before I could just like do anything. And like, I felt like invincible almost. And at that point, like I was like, I would drink and like, and I would, and I would just do different drugs. And, but it would like affect me way differently. Like I could feel that my body was not, was not having it anymore. Like I had abused my body too much, which to this day, I'm grateful. I don't have any like sort of health conditions, anything from that, uh, which I'm blessed to say that. Um, but I felt that also I met my wife at the, and at the time she was my friend. And, uh, and I'm just like, if I don't change my life, 
I'm never going to have anything. And like, I'm not going to have a family. I'm not going to have, I'm not going to be successful. Like, so that scared me the most, honestly, like ending up in prison for the rest of my life or ending up dead. Like that scared me the most. So that, that, that's what scared me to change. And then from there on, you just, was it like, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is the best way to mitigate risk is to make good decisions. And, uh, it sounds like that's what you did. Yeah. You just started to make good decisions and it just compounded over time. Yeah, exactly. One day at a time. And, uh, and then, so that's when I started, um, I actually went to, you think it's not like a, Oh my God, I changed this one thing. It's more like take it one day at a time, make one good decision little by little and over time things will get better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And, uh, and, or, I mean, you tell me, or is it more like huge one decision? Like, how do you think it works? How do you think you get better? No. And and a good friend of mine, Ken Jocelyn, he says, uh, incremental, not monumental decisions, like incremental, not monumental. So how can we just make one right decision Hmm. stacked on top of each other? Kind of like you're stacking wins. Because you stack enough wins, now you have momentum. And now once you have momentum, now you're rolling. And once you get rolling, then it's a lot harder to go the other way because you're already like going down the hill. It takes Mm -hmm. a lot more effort to kind of go backwards at that point. I'm not saying you can't go backwards. Like any, any one of us is one bad decision away from losing everything. If you think about it that way, like any, anybody is one bad decision away from losing everything. So also remembering that too. Yeah, that's scary even you hearing you say that. Um, but I think it's, it's what empowers you to keep going down the right path. Mm-hmm. So yeah. then you got a job cold calling? Yeah. Did you love sell, even selling? Space? That's my only skill. I'm like, that's all I could do. How do you sell <laughs> newspapers? I just to go back in time, like, yeah. how do you even sell a newspaper? You just like, uh, I guess that was a okay, thing. Okay, this was my you- thing. Yeah, this was my thing. Hey, it's Cameron. Um, hey, it's Cameron. I'm here. Uh, basically, uh, so so they actually told us, it was unfortunate. Like, I don't, I don't love this, but they, we were 14 years old and they literally like were hiring young kids and literally telling them to lie, saying that they were going to get free semesters at Pikes Peak Community College. It was kind of screwed up, but I did what they said. Hey, it's Cameron. Um, for every 50 people that I get to try it out for one month, I get a free semester at Pikes Peak Community College. Would you be interested? That was your pitch. Yeah. They told you to lie? Yeah, they told us to lie. Yeah. Like, That's fucked up. They would hire a bunch of kids. And tell them. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a... It was kind of like, uh, you know, like a uh, cutthroat industry. Um, yeah, they told us to lie. So, so for every 50 newspapers, so you made them an irresistible offer, made them an irresistible offer that, uh, kind of was guilt because wow. they told us and to you use the moral frame. Like, what are you going to feel? You're going to feel bad if you don't buy these newspapers. Like, so that was completely wrong. But like to be able to sell them, like obviously no, not everyone's just like, okay, I'll do it. Like I, they're still convincing there, like building relationships with people. So that's why I really learned it, some foundational people skills. Um, and actually, yeah, when I was 14 years old. And you probably were, learned persistence. Like, you probably learned to be okay with rejection. Like, yeah. I think, like, all of the, from looking back, like, all of those very difficult times probably made you, like, filled with steel. Like, no one could break you, you know? Mm-hmm. In sales. Oh, yeah. Like, do you really care if someone rejects you? Oh, I got the door slammed in my face. Guns pulled on me. Dogs let out. Yeah, it was all, it was, uh. I knocked on every single door in Colorado Springs. I'm, I'm like pretty certain about that. Wow. So uh, when I was four, from 14 till about 17, 18, I, I actually had a little sales crew that I started as well at the, at the it was the Gazette newspaper. And um, so I was like, I was running the crew at that point and selling myself too. Um, but yeah, when I was 14, I was making like, there was weeks I was making $1,000 when I was 14. So, um, okay. And then, Fast forward again, you got a cold calling job. Then wh- how do you start your agency? Like, cause I think yeah. like the really powerful thing behind your story is like you went from homeless, you went from overdosing, you went from being in jail as a teenager to now like you're a multimillionaire agency owner. Like that's, yeah. it's fucking amazing. Like I think. Thank you. That's like, you are the te- you are the teacher that kids need to see. You are the, the, your story is the, 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 the education that. I think teenagers and 20 year olds must consume, you know, I think, um, so, so yeah, tell us about that. How did you go from cold calling as a job, getting an apartment to then, okay, I'm going to start an agency. Yeah. So actually my, my roommate at the time, which we met at a different role that I was at when I was at the, 
I was at a different role, cold calling, and ended up doing a ton of sales there, like close to two million in in a year and three months. Um, but we met there, and so COVID happened. <clears throat> so I got laid off, furloughed, or like whatever you want to call it, and uh, I was making um, between like thirty and forty grand a month working a W two job, and I was promised uh, one million dollars a year. Uh, like about a month after that, if I came back on with him, um, and helped him like, and even, I was even promised like uh, other things. I, I can't really, uh, say them cause I said I wouldn't, but, uh, okay. it was, it was, <laughs> no, no one was asking. You yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, uh, <laughs> it, it was, uh, but it was hard You're not like, to come back. I can't back. tell you. Yeah. I can't tell you. I, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. But, uh, anyways, it was very hard to say no to that, but, I, so, so I got laid 30 to 40 K a month. Yeah. Yeah. And W2. Yeah. W2 job. Like, uh, it sucks. There's no tax benefits. You can't like do any write-offs. Um, so it wasn't good there, but, but it was cool. Like I was made, I had never made that much money. So it was, uh, it was fun. It was good. I was saving a lot. I was getting ready to invest a lot. I just bought a house later. I sold that house, made over six figures on that house just wow. in, in under two years. Um, so that kind of was what brought me into real estate investing which I'm doing now also, but the, but the agency, yeah, I started that when I got laid off and it was, yeah, we literally just started cold calling in our kitchen. Um, so one day you were like, I'm going to start an agency or after COVID. So COVID right hit. when I got laid off. Yeah. So you got laid off and then you were just like agency or. Well, my roommate at the times had been telling me we should do this with SEO. And I'm just like, it's, it's hard to walk away from 30 to 40 grand a month. It's just, yeah, it yeah. is hard to walk away from that. Uh, so it was a blessing to get laid off. Honestly, it was really a blessing. Because yeah, I tell, I tell people all the time, the most dangerous place to be in is a place of comfort if you're looking to grow. If yeah. you think about going to the gym, what are you doing to your muscles in order to make them stronger? You're quite literally causing stress. You're breaking them down. Uh -huh. And in order to grow, you must be in a state of pain, in a state of discomfort, in a state of, um, of discomfort, right? And, yeah. and I think like a lot of people get stuck when they're comfortable and they stop mm -hmm. growing because you're good. You don't need to. It's almost like I'm strong enough. I don't need to go to the gym. But in a weird way, you have to get uncomfortable in order to get even more comfortable later on. Right. So it sounds like this was a the blessing for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were able to um, get uncomfortable again. Yeah. Yeah, I was. So And it was very uncomfortable because it I went from – that amount of money zero. to absolutely zero. So I was like, I remember I was literally on, like, I like was just chilling on the Trust couch. Me, I was literally working for a bill, a billionaire family here in Denver. Every Thursday they would bring a massage therapist. We would get free <laughs> massages at work. Imagine going to work, making six figures and you get a massage just in the yeah. middle of the day on Thursday. And all the employees are taking turns. Like they get a massage. So you don't even have to leave the office. You're literally in the office. And they, they just do got this. the chair set up. Yeah, they bring in Chipotle every single day. You know how tasty that is every day? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't have to leave. I they want you comfortable. They want you comfortable because they know that if you're comfortable, you're not going to put yourself in an uncomfortable spot to get to the next level. That's why there's a lot of billionaires that say the W-2, the 9 to 5 is the golden handcuff. It's mm -hmm. the, the thing that keeps you a slave to the system because it's comfortable. It's not bad. It's just comfortable, which stops you from growing to the next level. Yeah. So, okay, back to you. Um, you, you started your agency and you started cold calling. Uh -huh. That's it. And the funny part about it is I started cold calling chiropractors, which I know is your, was your niche. Yeah, 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 it was. <laughs> did, you, did you know that back then or no? No, no. Well, no, I, I had no idea. I'm just like, chiropractic. And we even had like the name chiropractic SEO. Really? And, yeah. <laughs> That's such a like a... Uh... That's such a bad name. <laughs> and it was bad. And we were calling them That's like. such a bad name. Yeah. In the height of COVID. When we, when we started our agency, <laughs> my business partner, Marcos, at the time, um, we ended up splitting up. But he called our agency Social Media Marketing Agency. No. That was the name of the agency. No. Way. And I was like, dude, I don't care if this is like, ne like the name won't ultimately matter to your success. You need to focus on revenue generated activities. But I was like, I don't care. I'm changing the name anyways. <laughs> I'm not going to work for a company called Social Media Marketing Agency. Yeah, plus that, there's probably like 30 of those. I, I don't think so. <laughs> there's like, not that's that, a really oh. bad name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like chiropractor SEO. That's like calling yourself like 
dentist. <laughs> you know? No, I know. <laughs> so, worst time to start it for chiropractors. I'm literally cold calling their office. They're shut down. Oh, during COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're shut down. And I'm just like, but there's a better way. We can do this. We can do this. Let's get on a call. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, because I was so How many dials a day? Um, I, I mean, like, probably like 150. 150. Yeah, like you can do 200. Uh, if, you're, if you're really strategic about calling, you probably only want to do 50 to 60 calls a day because you want to be really highly targeted and understand who you're calling. Because if you're just like blasting a list, you have no information on these people. Like what is going to set you apart from the other like 900 people calling them? Mm, so quality over quantity. Yeah. So like, and doing that quickly too. So like, I'll like call them, get on their website, like look into them as much as possible while I'm, while it's ringing. And then that way I can be like, Hey, yeah. Like I saw your uh, dog on the website, you mm. know, like come in like that. And then that way you're not going in like, Hey, I'm trying to sell you something. Yeah. Hey, John. yeah. It's like the same as everyone else. Hey John, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How's it going? How's your day? <laughs> hey John, I saw your dog on the website. <laughs> That's better. Man, who's that? <laughs> I got a dog just like that. <laughs> That's way better. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I have a basset hound. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you're, don't tell them. And yeah, if you sign up, you get a free community college. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> don't say that, that. And by the way, I do not condone, like, I do not lie to people when I sell them. Like, that was kind of a bad situation under bad management. So... I definitely don't condone that. It was just part of... You know what You know what we're going to do? For anyone watching this video, I know we're kind of like in the middle right now, but if you're watching this video, um, if you make sure to like, follow, and then I'm going to drop Cameron's social so you can definitely go follow him. If you do, we're going to give away our entire cold call masterclass if you're down. Yeah. We did that inside of our private mentorship program. It has Let's like it. your cold calling script, your cold calling strategy, how to handle objections. Like you literally go over everything. So I don't oh, know if yeah. you'd be down to give it away. You know, you can get rich cold calling if you want to do it. And you're cool if we share that? Yeah, yeah, I'm cool with that. Okay, yeah. it's already been recorded. I Honestly, I didn't plan to say this in the middle of the podcast, but uh, I felt like it, would, it was a good time to, to share Perfect. it. So, um, yeah, if you guys like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and then make sure to follow Cameron. We'll give all that stuff away, the scripts, objection handles, like everything. So, um, okay, so then back to agency. You you started the agency, cold calling chiropractors, and then what? Like, how did you go from then to seven figures? Yeah, so I dropped I dropped chiropractors. I, I told him, my roommate at the time, I'm like, look. That's because you saw I was digital. You saw Joel Kaplan. You're like, I can't compete. I'm like, oh, guy. no, I I'm heard about kidding. it too many times on the calls. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we could work together. We do SEO. They could do I your know. ads. <laughs> yeah. This doesn't have to be a competition. <laughs> That's such a good pitch. Anyways. Yeah. But uh, anyways, so... Well, it was just a bad, it was a bad time. Like there's definitely pockets, like as you well know, like there's definitely pockets. Like you don't want to be pushing super, super hard into the wrong pocket at the wrong time. So we got out of chiropractors and I'm just like, look, I've sold so many businesses in my life that like, I don't know why I'm like, for me personally, there, it didn't really make sense to niche down. And the reason why is because with SEO, it's more about fundamentals, about Google's algorithm and understanding industries, but I've sold so many industries and worked with so many different businesses that I'm like, I don't know why I'm niching down. So I just started, I started selling. Yeah, I, I think niching down is more like for beginners. Like they have no idea how to sell. They have no idea how to get results. And it like allows you to become a domain expert. It exactly. allows you to get really good within this very narrow space so that you can actually compete against people that are really, really good like you and have the talent and have been selling since they were teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. So I. I understand like financial markets, like construction markets, financial advisors, um, like dentists. Not chiropr chiropractors. I've sold. <laughs> I've sold a ton of chiropractors. So that, know, that's why. <laughs> but but so like I. But you also like don't want to. One of my favorite sayings, um, or maybe not sayings. One of my favorite business philosophies comes from uh, Y Combinator, which is Sam Altman's um, accelerator. He's the founder of OpenAI and ChatGPT, and he says one of the biggest variables towards success in any company. And he actually believes this factor is more important than the actual team itself. And it's a growing market. So you never want to go against the wave, against the current. Like you said earlier, the more momentum you have, the easier it is to keep going and the harder it is to unwind that. Yeah. So you want to be in markets where there's momentum. And I think during COVID, it was smart to be in markets that had momentum, which there were some. Uh huh. Yeah, there was. So... 
yeah, just started pushing hard into that. And then my business partner and I, at the time we split up, he wanted to start a software company and wanted me to start selling on that. And I'm like, we got to stay consistent here because like, I'm trying to build something. And not only that, like I'm trying to have a stable situation. Like, uh, I'm not trying to like jump from like shiny object syndrome, which I'm not saying it was the wrong idea for him. Just for me, I wanted to stay laser focused on the agency. I'm like, I'm getting this thing to seven figures at that time. I'm like, I'm getting it to seven figures by the end of the year. We had like four months left. And like, I just had like a huge goal. I made it to 40 K a month. And then in like one month, I started selling right after he left 40 K a month. And then, um, had a lot of just, then all of the business issues happened. I'm like, okay, I've never dealt with any of these. Like what? Just everything. Like, uh, like how do I need to, how do I, how am I going to handle all these clients? Mm. Like now that I just sold them all, like I was used to just passing it on. Like, okay, his name was Michael, uh, Michael, you can, you can figure this out. Um, or we had a, we had someone named Stephanie working on our team. You can figure this oh, out. Oh, so your business partner was in charge of fulfillment. Yeah. And then he left. Now you're really good at sales, but you're, you're like, how do I actually run a business? Yeah. And good at marketing too. Cause that's all telemarketing is and, and, uh, door to door marketing. Like that's a form of marketing, which I later understood. I'm like, wow, like I've been doing marketing for a long time. Um, but yeah, so I had to understand, okay, now once I sell someone, how do I actually not just deal with them, but get them good results so that we can retain them for years. Like a lot of our clients, we have clients that we've retained for two years. Like since the agency has been around, I just got off the phone with, with several of them, like back to back calls. I still sometimes talk with them just because like, uh, we even became friends, some of us Mm. and, uh, and yeah, like we get them such good results. So that was the main thing for me. It's like, I don't want to just like close all of these deals and then just get terrible results. So like, I've got to figure out the results side too. So that was, uh, that was definitely, that was probably a much bigger struggle for me than sales. Mm. And then at 40 K a month, like around when did you then join agency lab, which used to be called seven figure agency? Yeah, I joined it. When did that happen? And how did you join? Like, what what was that process like? Yeah. So, uh, I'm pretty sure I, I saw some of your ads, you know, you were like all over and clearly you're the authority in the agency space and still are. So, uh, yeah, I just started consuming some of your, your, your free content. And like, I'm just like, man, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And you were real too. Like there's all these people out there and they're like, we'll help you uh, grow your business. And like, I'll help you grow your digital marketing company or like Look at my Lambo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you just rented that thing. Like, like we drive Tesla's. <laughs> yeah. 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 We drive. Te- yeah. So it's, uh, so actually, so then I booked a call. I'm pretty sure I'd like, uh, might've ghosted the sales rep. Really? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't Omir, but Omir ended up calling me back. And, uh, and then, so Omir, we, we were talking and I'm like, all right, look, I'm not, I'm not interested right now, but I'm maybe interested. I just got to look through things, think through things. So then we talked like about a month after that and I'm like, all right, let's do it. So that's when I started learning a lot more, even more sales channels. I didn't truly understand that you taught me like old email. I met one of our best clients through cold email. Mm. I were still a client and I just went to his uh, gender reveal. Mm. Um, awesome guy. Like, and he just, he grew his company. We, we started with him. He was at $500,000 in revenue. Um, this year, this last year he did 5.6 million. The year before that he did 5 million. So like in 18 months, we, we really were able to help contribute to him going zero to 5 million or 500,000 to 5 million. Wow. Um, and then now, yeah, he's become a great friend. We go to, CrossFit and things like that. So, so then, okay. So you joined agency lab and then 40 K scaled all the way up to like, what are you guys doing now? Uh, we're at like just over a hundred, maybe 105, 100. We, we should hit like 110 this month. Wow. And then what's, what's your goal? Like, what's the goal now? The goal for me in this is eight figures on the, on the SEO side. Mm. So SEO and web development, um, is getting that to an end. Recently, I've been thinking about that, right? Like, it isn't just about the financial goal. Like, I do want to be able to impact the the team along the way, which is one thing I've been working on because I wanted to control everything. Yeah, because I call you and I'm like, Cameron, you got to hire people. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah. And and I wanted to control everything because I'm like... This this has been our coaching calls. Cameron calls me because you signed up for our mastermind where you you essentially get to work with me one-on-one and then you call me and I'm like, have you hired someone? You're like, not yet. 
<laughs> and I'm like, hire someone by Friday. Yeah. I was like, I don't care anymore at this point. Just hire someone. <laughs> and figure it out. So yeah. you, you've started to build a team, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, we have a great client success slash project manager uh, who we hired back in August, right after I had, right after we had our baby. Mm. Like, uh, and that was a tough time. Our baby um, was born a little early. Gabriel was born a little early. And so he had to be in the NICU for a few weeks. That was a really tough time. I didn't know that. Yeah, <clears throat> that was hard. That was hard for sure. That was a hard time for us last year. Um, but through that, I just, I love the fact that uh, everything ended up okay with Gabriel. Uh, he's doing great, growing well. And the agency like grew. Like I didn't, I still, I still prioritize my time with my wife. I still prioritize my time with Gabriel. However, I still was able to grow this agency. I still was able to hire Jack, who has been thriving in that client success role, project management. and. Um, and so that that I'm 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 very uh, grateful for that that yeah that's really cool man so I mean I think uh I'd love to ask you some questions just about the overall journey I think like your story is so inspiring again Cameron I just want to thank you so so much for sharing it I truly believe that at least I again I don't want to impose on you but I truly mm-hmm. believe you should share the story as much as possible if you feel called to it of course um I think you uh you are a walking inspiration and um you inspire me you pushed me to be a, a better leader, a better man, a better entrepreneur. And I feel like, uh, man, you went from the darkest of darkest of darkest places to uh, having such a beautiful family, being so successful, being kind. I know you uh, do charity work as, w- as well. Like, yeah, your story is like amazing. So here's what I want to ask you. If you could go back in time to, uh, to Cameron that's sitting in pain in, in that moment of like, so much suffering and you're just wanting to escape through the drugs, through everything. Like, what would you tell yourself back then? Knowing now, knowing everything that you know now. Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's a hard <laughs> question. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> but I made it easy. That's it a good, be good content. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, what script should you use? That's an easy question. You know, that's not going to change anyone's life. No, you know? no, no. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, no, because like everyone was always telling me everything. It's like, can't, everyone always wants to help you. Like, yeah, what would you uh, tell yourself? I would, what I would tell myself is immediately, like completely disconnect yourself from every single association that you have. It's going to be okay. And don't just don't give up through that process, but completely disconnect yourself from every single association you have. Whether you think that they're your best friend, you have to disconnect from everyone. Um, and that's, and that's what I did. Like I literally did not, I disconnected myself from everyone. And I, and I had to do that in order to really, really find, even, even just find myself and like find who I was. And because I was just so polluted by what other people had thought, I was so polluted by other people's opinions, negative opinions. Um, so yeah. You've, uh, you've obviously succeeded so much. And, uh, like I said, been through some really difficult moments. Like what would you, if you had to pick one lesson that you're like, this is a good lesson that I'm, I take with me forever. What, what lesson would that be that you apply in business and life and everything? One lesson that I would take away just from my experiences would be for sure. And I know this sounds cliche maybe, but perseverance, um, no matter what comes at you, persevere through it. And also remembering that tomorrow is another day. Um, cause sometimes in business or in life or just in anything, like you can get beat up so hard that day. Um, and sometimes it can happen many days in a row. However, like tomorrow is a new day. Like you always, at the end of the day, you go to bed, you wake up, tomorrow is a new day. Um, and if you, if you persevere, like if you don't quit, you can't lose no matter what. Like if you, if you don't give up, then you can't actually fail. Even though failure, I think, is part of the process. And it's important to fail along the way. But if you don't actually give up, then you're never actually failing. So true perseverance, true perseverance. And it's, and it's hard even for me at times, right? Like there's times where I question like, what am I doing? Like, should I be doing something else? Like getting shiny object syndrome. And the more that I just persevere through that and push through it, the more that uh, just my life continues to get better and better. Was there anyone along the journey that gave you a piece of advice that you thought was like really powerful in those dark moments? I'm sure you got a lot of advice. I'm sure you got a lot of people funny, like 
and all the different rehab centers and different houses. Yeah. Like, do you feel like there was something that stood out along the way? Something that stuck with you? Yeah. Um, for sure. So it sounds crazy. And this actually is a, a scripture, which they didn't like tell me the scripture, but this was when, so I was in uh, the homeless shelter. I was in the homeless shelter program. It's like they have a program that you can try and quit drugs in their in their thing. And uh, it's honestly really hard because what they do, you're up in a room full of bunk beds and they have you along the back. And then the, the traditional like homeless shelter is all uh, every other bunk but the bun- bunks in the back. So they're all connected. So everyone's coming in there drunk, like bringing in crack and like all the things. Um, so I was trying to get sober there and I was still smoking crack in the bathroom, like drinking like because everyone it's just it's a hard place to get sober and uh i remember that i went downstairs and like there's all these chaplains coming in to talk to you um because there's a i'll get like there's a lot of people trying to help in that uh in that network like when you're in those homeless shelters like there is a lot of help there's a lot of help out there i think people just don't want the help um is quite honestly what it boils down to i didn't want the help but Mm, someone told me it seemed like it wasn't until you decided i need to change that things started shifting yeah. Even though you had all these resources, all these places that even if you were paying for it until you were, yeah. until you were in it all in and you burned the boats. I know. Yeah. Elon Musk could have came up to me and said, this is what you need to do. I don't know. I know successful. you like your Tesla. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying like, it's that bad though. Like it's that bad. Like if know, you're dead set on something, I know, I know. it's just, however, I know. Th- what this guy told me, he just, all he said is like, read Romans eight, like in the Bible. So I'm like, okay. Um, he gave you that curiosity hook. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He didn't tell me what it was about. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to click on this. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. an ad. Yeah, yeah. The clickbait. <laughs> like, what is this? Click. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I just, like, when you ask me that question, like, obviously, there's so many people that have said something to me, but that's the first thing that came to mind. Mm. Um, what is it? Do you remember? Uh, so it, it you, you, you want to go read it for yourself. Uh, you want to go read it? <laughs> go read it for yourself. <laughs> yeah. No. Is that where we're ending it? Is there like, can you tease it a little bit? Yeah. So it just, it, it's basically going through, uh, because I, I didn't just stop there. So I stopped, uh, into like Romans 10, nine, where it says like, uh, that if you b- confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, they died from the grave, then you will be saved. And at that point, like, I just literally like said it out loud. Uh, like Jesus is Lord. Like I like shouted it in the homeless shelter. It was kind of a weird situation. I don't know why I did it. Um, so that, that was the interesting part. Like I didn't stop there at Romans eight. Like I kept reading in, into Romans 10. And then, so I went downstairs. Then again, there's another like pastor guy there because there's a ton of pastors that come in Catholic churches. Like just everyone is coming in there trying to help you. Like people volunteering, like everyone wants to help you. But like I said, most people don't want help. Um, but I just remember going down there and just feeling like, literally like a shaking sensation. Um, and then I went back upstairs and uh, the guys there, because we were supposed to get alcohol and buy crack that night. Um, and they thought that I like stole their, not stole their money, but they thought I like did it without them because I was like full of so much joy. Um, and I just remember that was like my, that was my like first true experience, like experiencing God, like wholeheartedly mm. and um i don't know that i i guess yeah you asked me that question that's the first thing that came wow that's me. cool i think like uh you know i believe in a higher power and i think like we have so much stress and anxiety in the world and so much fear and i think when you finally surrender and let go it's freeing and i think like when you feel that for the first time it's like liberating in a way you, it's almost like you remove the shackles of fear of uncertainty of anxiety which is a part of life, but for a, for a, even for just a moment, it, it disappears. I um, felt free. Yeah. Um, two more questions for you. Um, actually, th- I'm going to sneak three more. All right. Craig, is that okay? Craig's our Thanks, video. Craig. Craig's our video guy filming Craig's this. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, go give, go give uh, North River Media a uh, five star review on Google. There you go. Oh, River North. River uh. North. Don't get it wrong. River North Media. This is the first time I've been here. River North Media. And then hire Cameron to do the SEO to boost it. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so a few more, um, few more questions. This is me genuinely curious. How would you fix homelessness and drug addiction? Or are they two different problems? 
or like, I guess, how would you solve both of those? I'm actually there are two curious. different problems. So, and, and that's a huge question. Like, you know, everyone has their opinions on that. Um, I know, but I feel like you've lived through it and yeah. you've come out the other side. You're like living proof of like what it takes to actually get to the other end. And, so I, uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> especially in homeless, in the homeless situation, actually a lot of it is around it's not just drugs or alcohol. Like most of it is, I would say a huge portion of it is, but some of it is mental health related. So I think, especially around the mental health side and, and addiction is a mental health disorder as well. So I think truly, truly approaching these mental health uh, scenarios and situations. So like for me, <clears throat> like all the pain that I had from my dad, like growing up, um, that was I was trying to run away and, and that's why I don't blame him for anything anymore. And I'm so glad like our relationship is awesome now and I don't blame him for any of that. It was my fault. Like I'd made the decisions I made and it was my choices. However, I, I believe like having better, that's a, I mean, that's a hard question. It's a huge issue, but better like mental health resources. I'm like helping people with the root of their problem because the root of their problem is not alcohol. The root of their problem is not drugs. The root of their problem is not being homeless. Like that homeless guy. Yeah, they're escaping the pain within. Exactly. Yeah, like I met homeless people when I was homeless and they're like, I have no family at all. Like every single one of my family members died. At one point I was a dentist and just things kind of spiraled out of control and now I'm here and uh, don't know what to say. So dealing with that, like if they face that head on, they're like, I have no family. I was a dentist. I lost everything. I'm divorced. Like. My life seems like it's over, but it's not over until it's over. Like, it's not over until you stop breathing. So every single person, like, no matter you're 18 listening to this or you're 75 listening to this, like, it's not over until you stop breathing. So you can always turn it around. Like, no matter what happened to you, like, if you have absolutely no family left in your life, you have absolutely, you feel like you have nothing left to live for. You, you can turn that around, like, but you have to face those things head on. Like you have to, I guess they're, they're kind of like your demons. Like you have to face them head on. And if you don't do that, and I guess you asked me what I would tell my, tell myself, that's, that actually would probably be what I would tell myself if I came back and talked to me when I was 18, face your deepest hurts head on, like face How them. How would you do that? Like I, I, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge promoter of therapy. Like therapy helped me a lot. I struggled. I got bullied a lot when I was a little kid. When I moved to the United States of America, I didn't speak any English. Like it was hell. Obviously, like you experienced some extremely difficult challenges that I've never even gotten near to. But like I was in a lot of pain, at least mentally, like until I went to therapy and processed those, uh, those moments and just like work through them and really felt them and really accepted them and, and work through them. like. I still held on to that pain. Like, how would yeah. you do it? Yeah. So facing it head on for me, it looked like, because there's still so much, like even down to when you're a child, like I, at, at a certain point, I tried to commit suicide. I like put my fingers in the outlet when I was, I don't know exactly how old I was, but I was like eight. And I'd forgot about that moment in my life for years. And like one day I'm just like thinking about my entire life. Like, um, how did I get to where I'm at right now? Like, how did it get to be so bad? And like just working through these scenarios. And I believe like, so God brought Naomi, my wife, into my life for, for such a time at that time that I needed her because like I was able to share all these things with her, like all these just absolutely crazy things and hurtful things. And I think talking it about, talking about it with someone what, what, is what, huge. Like one of my favorite phrases for mental health is the opposite of depression is expression. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of us tend to hold on to our fears, our uncertainties, our darkest, most painful demons. And the only way to let them out is to express. You almost have to let them out of your body through word. Yep, exactly. Yeah, if you hold it in, it it eats you inside. So like those hurts that you have from when you're 12 years old, those those hurts that you have from when you're five, those hurts that you have from being bullied in school, which I had some of that stuff happen too. So like all of those, if you don't, if you never let them out, never talk to anyone about them, then our, it's not like it just goes away. 
Like you, you may think you're stuffing it down as far as possible, but like the deeper that you stuff it, the worse the issue actually becomes inside. So this is really challenging. And I know that, um, I know that it's a very complicated question, but how would you fix like addiction, homelessness? Would you like bring more therapy, therapy? Would you like create a brotherhood where there's like, like at least for men where there's like a lot more people, like you said, you, you said that the environment is really powerful. Like would you bring a lot of men that are doing well in their life to support that one individual that isn't like that way they have a lot more positivity around them? Like, how would you solve the problem? Have you ever thought about this? It's, yeah. It's almost like, um, I don't know if I've ever told you the story. I remember when I first moved to uh, Boulder, there was, there's a lot of homelessness in Boulder and uh-huh. uh, I didn't really have an opinion on homelessness. So I decided I'm going to give $20 to 20 different homeless people just to see what I just to talk to them and just get to know and decide. And like, I found some people that were in a lot of pain, didn't care. There's some people that were neutral and some people were really grateful, really happy to talk to me. And I almost felt like I still don't know, you know, like I still felt like yeah. kind of right back where I started with my, I don't want to call it an experiment, but like, I just wanted to learn more if, instead of trying to judge so much or like have this like preconceived notion about homeless people. I was like, let me actually go out and see for myself and talk to homeless people. And I think like, but I, I, after I did that, I was like, okay, I'm right back to where I started. Yeah. There's some good people. There's some people that don't care about you. And there's some people that are bad. Yeah. Like that's kind of like human humanity as a whole. But what yeah. would you say is like, and I don't even know why I'm sharing that. I guess the point is I don't know how to solve the problem. I'm genuinely curious. How would you solve it? Just like tactically, would you bring in therapists? Would you like, what would you do? Well, and that's funny you mentioned that because, so I'm the president of the board of this nonprofit called Recovered on Purpose. And uh, essentially our mission there is to end addiction. Um, so what we're doing right now is, uh, so my good friend, uh, basically my best friend, uh, his name's Adam Vibe Gunton. And he's, he's the one that like, it, it, it initially was his vision. He went through like a lot of homeless, homelessness, drug addiction, all that. So we're actually working to raise several million dollars. Um, and he's meeting with some grant writers and kind of working towards pushing that mission forward. As far as it's, it's a tough mission. Cause you have to understand like, uh, most people are in the same situation I was in. Like, I don't want help. So like, so if you don't want help, like I'll give you an example. I was driving a few weeks ago and, uh, I just felt like I was supposed to go talk to this homeless guy. So I pulled over in my car. I went over and go talk to him. I said, Hey man, how can I help? What do you need? And all he said is I need blankets. That's all he said. So I thought that was cool that he was being genuine and not saying like, I need a hundred bucks so I can go buy something. Um, but when I was just, I was talking to him more and based off of our conversation, he was okay being where he was right now, which was sleeping in his car with his dog. He was okay with that. So I think ending it entirely, I don't, I don't know exactly how that would work because I think that there is a lot of people that are actually okay with it. And at that time I may have been okay with it too. So it's more of, I think, educating people when they're younger, which is why Adam is going to be speaking in schools. I think that's where it all starts. It Mm. starts when you're young, right? So like if we can get into elementary schools, middle schools, even high schools, I mean, high school, you're even getting to the, to the point where it's like, you you really start to have autonomy. You start to like, you can go out and do your own things, make your own decisions, which is tough, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you really, that's interesting. I love that answer. If you really want to solve it, it starts with the younger age. It starts with prevent. It's almost like prevent. It's like same with the handling objections. It's better to prevent the objection. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if more education went into this, like just real, real, real talk, like in school, Hey, like, or maybe here, right here. Right here. Yeah, right here. That's literally, I think what's, you know what I I used to, Cameron, I don't know if you know this. I used to work at a uh, education company. I went to hundreds of high schools all across the nation. I've spoken to thousands of students and uh, I I feel like I have more reach now on YouTube or on TikTok. So it's like, maybe that's where it starts. Maybe. That's a good point. Just, Just a seed to plant. I don't know. No, that's a good point. Yeah. I'm not saying you shouldn't go into that, but I feel like. Right. um, that's interesting. So education, that's where it begins. It starts with the, at a younger age, preventing the problem. I mean, that's what I think. Because if you go talk to someone, and I'm not saying that you're, like I said, it is not over until it's over. It's not over until you stop breathing. However, the people that I've talked to that are really deep into this, it is, the deeper you get into it, the harder it is to get out because you start developing more baggage. Like when I was 18, it would have been easier for me to get out than when I was 24 when I did. 
So the longer that you're going, like the more baggage that you have and like the more that your mindset is kind of shifting and like, I'm not, that's what I'm saying. Like there isn't anyone too far gone, but like the farther that you go along it, the harder the it gets. Yeah. And it seems like we, when you told the story of the person that just needed the blankets, it seems to me that it's not so black or white. Maybe, maybe it's such a complicated problem and that's okay. It doesn't have to be. There doesn't need to be such a simple answer. Yeah. And uh, I think in life, oftentimes, for very complicated things, we're looking for simple answers when in reality, we must surrender and it doesn't, you don't have to have a simple answer. Maybe the answer is complicated. Maybe the answer is, it's a lot of different factors. And yeah. I, uh, you know what I, I do want to share though? You know what you offered that guy? You offered him love. You offered him support. You offered him empathy. And, and I think, and, and I think that is proven to work across the board. And I saw him, he came to church on New, on uh, Christmas Eve and I went over and talked to him and the guy literally emptied out his pocket. Like he had just a bunch of pens, fives, ones. And he's like, where, where can I uh, give this as a donation to the church? Like the guy literally emptied out his pocket. So like it showed that guy's heart is in the right place. So like, I don't really know if he's quite honestly, I don't know if he like is in, I mean, he looks like he's in a worse place. Like to all of us like on the outside, but maybe like on the inside, he's not in a worse place than a lot of people out there. There's a lot of very miserable, successful people. Mm. So I don't know. I thought that was crazy. I don't know how That's to interpret really that, but I'm just like, this guy literally just gave all of his money. Like, yeah, I don't know. It just, I don't know how to interpret that. Like I said, but it, it was just, uh, it was cool to see him too, uh, to, to show up. Cameron, final question. And by the way, for everyone that stayed until the end, thank you so much for watching. And, um, Again, I just want to take a moment to thank you, Cameron. You're such an inspiring individual, such a good friend. And uh, I'm grateful that you took that leap into se seven-figure agency that way Me back too. when, because I, I don't know if we would have crossed paths otherwise, and we wouldn't be here today, and you know, we wouldn't be sharing your story. So Me too. I'm really grateful. And uh, again, for anyone that's watching, if you're down, I'd love to give away your entire cold call masterclass that you, that you did for us inside of our private mentorship program inside of Agency Lab. Yeah, We can literally just give it away. Yeah, we can. Yeah. I'd love for them to have it. And uh, thank yeah. you, my friend. Yeah. Um, of course. Uh, I think uh, we'll link it in the, we'll link it in the description and we'll give it away for free. Um, that being said, last question for you. Any final words of wisdom that you want to share? Or a, b a better way to ask it. What final word of wisdom? <laughs> I don't want you to be like, no, I'm not sharing it. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. No, what, what, would, what, what words of wisdom or which words of wisdom would you like to share as a final note for the audience. So in that same vein, like no matter if you're at $100 million in revenue or you're at negative $500 in your bank account, I'm sure that every single person has some sort of emotional baggage that they're dealing with um, or maybe haven't dealt with. And I, I want to encourage you to go all in on dealing with that and bringing it to the surface, share it with someone, get it out there and heal from that because it's going to pay you back. Talk about ROI. The ROI on that is going to be massive. Infinite. Infinite returns. Cool. Well, Infinite cash flow. Got the uh, bracelet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool, man. Well, thank you so much for being here. I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. All right. I think we're done. <laughs>